Hello everyone, I would like to take you on a little bit of tour of how your mind and your body work together as an incredible system. Uh, so to do this, I would like to invite you to join me in a short movement. So if you could, if you'd like to, please stand up. Now, to do this, we're going to do, we're going to do two bend over, sort of, you know, like a toe touch. Um, yeah, I know, so some of you who are very close to each other, I, I would recommend if you're really close to somebody, uh, turn to your right, everybody, about 45 degrees. Then you'd have enough room to reach down. <laughs> okay, the first thing that I'd like you to do is I'd like you to just let your chest open up a bit. Take a nice deep breath into your belly, and then bend over, but not, we're not looking for a stretch. I'm not looking to see how far you can push yourself. Just bend over until you meet resistance, and then come back. Okay, now I would like you, once you stand back up, we're going to look over our head and shoulder a few times. So... If you could turn your head all the way to one side and your eyes all the way to one side, really look what's behind you. And then turn your head all the way to the other side and really stretch your eyes as far as they'll go to that side. Then back to the first side, your eyes all the way around behind you. And then one last turn. Perfect. Try another toe touch. See if anything has changed. So, did anyone see a difference? <laughs> did it, was anyone able to, able to bend over farther? Yeah, I think if we had more space, you'd see more of you do this. Please, thank you. Have a seat. So, we've just experienced something quite interesting. We, we experienced that we were able to bend over farther. Our body adapted in our legs, but we didn't do any stretching. Right? It was just from this head and eye movement. So, what happened? And what we just experienced was a wonderful way in which the brain and the body, the mind and the body are synchronized. So when you could see on an unconscious level that you are safe, your body immediately went through a number of changes. For one, the muscles that are normally in, in a type of stabilization started to move into mobilization. And this is a perfectly reasonable response. I want to be stable if I don't know what's around me and what's going to happen. As soon as I really know what's happening around me, my body's ready to move. It's ready to interact. But a few other muscles were changing as well. So you probably didn't notice this. We would have to go further into this to explore it. But muscles in your ear were relaxing, allowing you to more accurately hear the sound of human voices. When you are experiencing anxiety and experiencing stress, your ear is tuning to high-frequency sounds like screams or low-frequency sounds like predators. The muscles in your face were also starting to relax. That is, they were starting to energize your face to become more expressive so that you could communicate what you feel and what you want or what you don't want to other people. The muscles in your throat were relaxing, allowing your voice to take on more dynamic range. That is, allowing your voice to communicate more about what's happening inside of you and what you think. So what I want to talk to you about today, I want to talk to you about how our bodies and how our movements shape the way we think and shape the way we connect to other people. So I've always loved this image here because I think it exhibits this phase we're in right now in the world where, where we've created technology that got us out of one trap and it led us into another. So technology got us out of this trap of not having access to information. You know, information used to be scarce. And, and I, I was out with an Irish friend having a drink last night, uh, relaxing before this event, and we were talking about this point, and he told me a little perfect anecdote of this. He went to a Catholic school, and he was quite young at the time, and he heard some older students talking about something. He thought, 
I don't know what that word was. That's interesting. So he goes to the librarian, and she says, can I help you? And he says, yes. Do you have any books on lesbians? <laughs> so you, you, he had to go to another human being to find this out. He couldn't just pull out his phone and check it. So what we've done is we've, we've liberated the world's information, but we've also started to reduce the world to just information. And we see this through the way that we're using the technology, the interface. The interface that we're using right now is in many important ways cutting us off from awareness of our environment. It's cutting us off from dynamic interaction with other people. It's cutting us off from a clear sense of what's happening in our own bodies. This is a wonderful bit of research uh, that was done on the subjective experience of emotion. So one of the things that we're learning is that emotions are not something that happen in your head. They're a dynamic interplay between your mind and your body. So what we actually experience when we experience an emotion is a physical sensation. And when you look at this chart here, what you're seeing are the red and yellow zones show where there is heightened sensitivity when someone feels that emotion. And the blue are where people feel lower sensitivity when they feel that emotion. Okay, the, the ability to clearly sense our emotions, to identify our emotions and to be able to work with them is absolutely at the center of, of our ability to be able to connect to each other of our ability to understand ourselves and our experience, to be able to understand what, what, what is happening to us. And what we're finding, there's a lot of research now suggesting that there's a very close relationship between high levels of smartphone use and emotional suppression, especially in teenagers. What do you, what do you get when you start to suppress your emotions? That is, you either push away from them or you learn to ignore them you become much more vulnerable to anxiety and depression. But even more so, we need our bodies fundamentally to be able to understand each other, to be able to clearly communicate with each other. And I think a wonderful window into that is gesture, the way we use our hands. So gesture is incredible. We're just at the beginning of understanding this world of gesture and how powerful it is. We've learned that gesture actually precedes language. So gesture is what babies would develop before they develop language. And more than that, it helps them to develop language. If you're taking care of a child and you're using gesture and language together, your child will develop the ability to speak earlier than if you only use language with your child. But we can go even further than this. And I think this is a really beautiful experience here. We are surrounded by complex systems. So we have a system like this. This is the system of an engine. And um, every complex system, and we talked about a lot of them today, right? climate change, the, the economy, every complex system has two fundamental layers. There's a structural layer, which is how all the different pieces of the system you know, sit together, what those pieces are, basically. And then there's a dynamic layer. And the dynamic layer are how those pieces interact and what effects they have on each other. We know that understanding dynamics is much harder than understanding structure. But it's absolutely key to being able to solve problems. So Barbara Tversky, who, was, who is a, a wonderful researcher from uh, University of Stanford, uh, so she's at Stanford, and what she did is an experiment to say, could gesture change the way, could it improve the way we understand dynamics? And so she and her team took the workings of an engine, and they broke it down into a script. And the script talked about structure, and it talked about dynamics. And then they took people, and they had people read this script uh, on, on film, and they read it two times. So they read the same script, but in the first video, they made 11 gestures that talked about structure, where things were, what they were, a piston. Then they did a second video, and they made 11 gestures that talked about dynamics, how things work together, how the piston drove the shaft, for example. They filmed that, and then they played both of those videos to groups, to large groups of, 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 of people. So a large group of people would see one or the other video. The people then would have to take a test on the material. They would have to make a design of the engine. They would draw it out. 
and they would make an explainer video themselves. The people who watched the video, remember, same person, same script, the only difference being the gesture. The people who watched the video with the dynamics gestures did far better on the exam, especially the questions that we're asking about dynamics. They made drawings that were far more detailed and more accurate. And third, when they made their own explainer videos, they made videos that, that were clearer about actions and included more action words than were originally in the script. They filled in missing pieces. Gesture changes the way we think. And here's the real key. This is the key to all of it. We move in order to think. Movement is what helps us think. It's what is the foundation of our thinking. But movement does so much more. And another beautiful window into this, movement also shapes our thinking about the world and how it works. We also use movement to build trust. So there was a beautiful uh, uh, experiment, and this, in this experiment they had groups of people who came together to play an investment game. And the investment game would measure how much these people playing the game trusted each other. And they had two groups, one group that just came together to play the game, and a second group that did movements before. They did short exercises before they played. The group that did the movements, the group that did the exercises, showed far higher trust scores. That is, they exhibited much more provable, demonstrable proof of trust than the group that did not. And here's the interesting thing, and I, it's kind of an ironic thing. I, the companies that are creating the, 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 the information technology that, that in many cases is, is part of the driver of this problem, they understand this. They know this. So the Apple headquarters, uh, the new Apple headquarters in California, look at that space that's in the middle. Right? They've got their, their own little park there. That space and that entire building was specifically designed to facilitate walking meetings. They designed the space so that the groups could walk and talk and be in private. They wouldn't have to worry about someone overhearing their conversations. Steve Jobs was a huge believer that walking and talking improved the way he thought. And now we're understanding there's a huge amount of evidence that shows us why this is so, why this is that we're learning so much more of when we start to move, when parts of the, the different hemispheres of our brain communicate with each other, when we start to make gestures and we're able to synchronize with each other. We become entangled and we are better able to understand each other. Uh, I've been writing a book about this, and I'm interviewing lots of people about the way they move and how that shapes the way they think, and I talked to a Google engineer about this, and he's interesting because he's an engineer for Google in a very senior position, and every time I talk to him, he's in a different Google office. And I, I said, why do you travel so much to other Google offices? I mean, you, your company is about making the world's information available to everyone, and you clearly have the best collaboration tools we could imagine. Why do you travel so much? And he said, oh, it's very, it's very simple. We consider live meetings to be high-bandwidth meetings that are much more likely to create trust and rapport. Online meetings we consider to be narrow-bandwidth meetings. They're good for coordinating things, but they're not good for building relationships necessarily. What I would recommend to you, and really this is a beautiful thing you can start to do, I recommend become a student of your own movement. That is, start to study how your movement shapes your thinking, how your movement shapes the way you understand and connect to other people. You can, for example, try walking meetings. Very simple step. See if they facilitate more understanding with your groups. Get out of the office. Look at your gestures and start to think about when you're explaining systems, you're explaining complicated things, are you helping the person by showing them with your hands how it works? If you don't, you're not helping them understand. We need each other. We need these clear explanations to solve the problems that we have. 
And I think one of the most important things, certainly in my experience, you can learn about how emotions move in your body. Yes. <laughs> that is my son, and he is learning right now. <laughs> Exactly. Learn how emotions move through your body. <laughs> and I would also say, go even farther. Think about where you have patterns in your life. So if people say, oh, I want to move outside the box, I want to get outside of the box, are you moving outside of the box? Are your movement patterns restricted? Are you moving in the same repetitive ways again and again? If you talk about feeling blocked in your life or you feel stuck, I mean, how many of us feel stuck in our lives? How does the way you move represent that? How does the way you move represent being stuck? Because if you change how you move, you will change how you think. If you want to go really far, and I've got two beautiful examples, if you want to see what happens and how flexible your mind is and how the body is the driver of that, what I would tell you is try to remove a sense. So you could remove a sense like vision. People who remove vision, the students in brain imaging exams, when they take vision away, within a matter of days and weeks, the part of their brain dedicated to feeling takes over the part of the brain that's dedicated to vision. That is, they have a massive brain adaptation in a period of days and weeks. Or, you could add a sense. Okay, what does that mean to add a sense? I met a cognitive science, a professor of cognitive science at the University of Osnabrück, uh, Professor Peter Koenig, and he is a wonderful thinker about the brain, and he's always argued to his students, our brain is completely flexible, it's plastic, it can go anywhere, and it could adapt to a new sense. We just happen to have the senses we have. So his students, one night, having drinks, they said, like what? What would be another sense that we could have? And he said, well... We could, have, we could have the ability to detect magnetic fields. We could, you know, like a compass in us. Lots of animals do that. That's how they navigate. And they said, yeah, but how would you do that? How would you build that other sense? And he thought about it and talked to them. He said, well, you wouldn't be able to have it be something you would read or train cognitively. You couldn't, you couldn't train it with your conscious mind. You'd have to learn it through the body. So he created a belt, and this belt had a series of buzzers around it, like in your mobile phone. And those buzzers were connected to a compass. And when you would turn, the part of your body that was pointing north would buzz. And you would have to wear that 24 hours a day for weeks. And so he wore it, and I asked him, did you feel any difference? I mean, could you notice another sense? And he said, oh, oh yeah, for sure. <laughs> okay, well, what was it? What was the experience? And he said, you know, I wore it for weeks and I didn't really notice anything until one day I was at home and I was distracted and my wife asked me about where something was in town. And I just said, it's there. And she said, what, like by the dishwasher? What, 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 what do you mean there? And he said, I stopped and I realized that in my mind I was just reaching out with an extremely long arm and touching that place. And then I began to experience that everywhere I went became something that was part of my body that I could just touch. That I would, I would ride my bike through the countryside, and if I knew I was alone, I could close my eyes and I could feel every contour in the land. Every place became something I was connected to. And when he took it off, he said, when I took it off and that sense went away, it felt like the world was like collapsing in on me and becoming confusing and disorganized. And, and I think that's where we all are right now. We are all in a state where when we have reduced the world to information, the, our sense of the world becomes small and confusing and disorganized. We are all desperate to be connected. We want to be like the bird that can go home because thousands of miles away it knows it's just there. I live here. We want to be connected. We want to be connected to each other. We need to be because that's the only way we can make sense of the world and solve the biggest problems that we have. And I firmly believe that the technology of the future is the one we've had for so long. It's our bodies. Thank you. <laughs>